Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. We're excited that you've joined us. We've got a really cool topic. I'm interested. I really want to hear what our, our speakers are going to be talking about today. It's about securing your app modernization journey. Great to have you with us today. A few things that we want to uh, just cover here. First of all, our web webinar today is sponsored by Red Hat and Sumo Logic. My name is Mitch Ashley. I'll serve as your host and moderator. A little bit of housekeeping. Everybody that, that uh, registered for the webinar will receive an email with a link to the recording of the webinar. And I believe we'll be sharing the slides as well. So we'll be, be able to provide you whatever handouts that we have uh, that are going to be talked about during our uh, webinar today. Also, uh, we are doing a drawing for four gift cards, four $50 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around to the end. Must be present to win. Uh, the gift card, so we'll be announcing that a little bit later. Last but not least, as I know, we have some excellent presenter. They're going to be having some conversation, not just presenting to you. I also know that they love questions. So we've got a lot of information to share, but if you have any questions, we'd love for you to pop those into the chat window. Speaking of that, if you look at the right side of your screen, you'll see a few things like chat and Q&A tabs. That's right where you can post a question. You can say something in chat. I'll be sending out a few messages that way as well. So you're welcome to interact with myself and our presenters uh, through chat. So let's get right to our content. Again, we're talking about secure your app modernization journey. It's my distinct pleasure to change the slides here <laughs> to introduce our two speakers for today. First is Charles Kalaji. Charles works, actually, I work together with Charles at Accelerated Strategy, where he's an analyst covering particularly the security space and DevOps and some other areas. Charles, would you give us a brief introduction to yourself? Oh, thank you, uh, Mitch. Yes, and we've done a lot of uh, interesting projects together on uh, DevOps and, and security. So I've been in the security field uh, doing data security and information security before the internet even showed up. So uh, I've seen the trans transgression, the transition <laughs> throughout uh, the, the, the environment, I guess we could say, uh, from, from those early days to, to now and all of that's gone on in between. So it's really nice to be able to take all that information and share it uh, uh, with people. And uh, I've been a market analyst, I worked in the, the intelligence agencies, and uh, uh, just uh, happy to uh, share my information and my knowledge. Fantastic. We get the the light side of, of Charles today. We're going to talk about the dark side of his past and all the secret stuff he's done. That's for another time. But anyway, so it's also my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Garish Bot. Garish is VP Marketing. He covers several areas at Sumo Logic, uh, including security, CI, platform, things like that. Uh, Garish, why don't you introduce yourself, and then I'm, I'll just let you take it away from there, okay? Uh, sure. Hey, thanks, Mitch, for uh, helping us kick off this session. I'm Garish but I'm VP at Sumo Logic. Yes, I do cover multiple functions at Sumo. I won't get into the specifics, specifics of that today. Uh, I'm really excited about today's session, primarily because I started my career as a software developer. In, I started off writing software in the old school way of doing things where waterfall was in vogue and then transition to being a software developer with, when Agile was uh, gaining acceptance and then spent many years there leading to early stages of DevOps, CI, CD kind of paradigm shift that happened and then moved to product. And then I've been leading several go-to-market functions at several companies, including Sumo. Yeah, for, for, for me, what I'm really seeing from a macro perspective is before we jump into the trend, it's a convergence of different forces, right? So there's, it's no longer the case where IT security and other functions can work in isolation or in a fragmented fashion. It, to uh, Charles's earlier point, yeah, there are a lot of mistakes done by the security folks, right? And the many mistakes continue to be made, whether it's a legacy old school ways of software development or modern ways of doing it. So that's what we're hoping to explore here. Excellent. Cool. So uh, thanks. Uh, so uh, folks, so this agenda, what we put together, I, I believe is very timely. 
uh, leading to this uh, session or this event, Charles and I, we were brainstorming, app, what's the application economy about? Why do you need to modernize and things like that? So one of the interesting facts about the app economy, as people like to call it, which is often associated with the mobile side, not necessarily enterprise side, but the key point I wanted to make is that app economy is a multi-trillion dollar business. I mean, yes, it is a multi-trillion dollar business, right? So why is that? I, I personally believe that it's because there is a lot of legacy ways of doing it, kind of hybrid way of doing it, modern ways of doing it, building apps and sunsetting them or modernizing them, right? And so what we want to do today is not necessarily look at how to do how to modernize apps, but rather what are the security challenges that the industry is experiencing and also provide a little bit of a roadmap or a, a sneak preview of what you ought to consider as part of your app modernization journey. So having said that, I'll I'll spend a few minutes intro, uh, giving you a quick overview of who Sumo Logic is. Sumo Logic is truly an innovative cloud native company. We were founded roughly about 11 years ago. And since then, we have been helping thousands of companies across the world help uh, with their cloud journey and as well as solving security, IT operations, and now what's called observability related use cases. We have about 2,000 plus customers who use a cloud native platform either for security use cases, IT operations use cases, or observability use cases. That's the beauty of having a single unified platform. Um, along the way, we have, we, we have had the opportunity or privilege of working with leading brands as well as not so very well known brands, yet very innovative customers across the world. So one of the things which uh, we take great pride in, not only being an innovative company, but also how our platform is built. We created a software category called continuous intelligence, mainly because what we realized was there are a lot of analytic solutions out there, but none of them provided the right insights or intelligence across security IT operations and observability use cases. So that's a new category that we have created and we continue to pioneer that. So a little bit about our platform. Uh, any given day, we have more than 100,000 active users using our platform. We have a lot more who are authorized to use it. Uh, just to give a sense of where things are from a scale perspective, I won't get into the details because it's just really hard to keep track of the scale related numbers because yes, it exponentially keeps increasing. On any given day, our platform analyzes more than one exa exabyte of data. And exabyte is, if you do the math numbers, it's like two to the power 15 or it's 1024 petabytes of data every day is being analyzed. So for those of you who like to think about records, it's about a, roughly about a quadrillion records a quadrillion folks is 1,000 trillion records. This is what being analyzed by our platform. So if anyone thinks scale and how, whether it, our platform scales, here is further evidence. And also what's interesting is scale, uh, we, uh, we can also dynamically scale up or scale down. Uh, just to give an example, in a matter of minutes for a key customer who runs a premier sporting event arguably the most well attended sporting event, at least in Americas or Western Hemisphere. Um, if we scale from few hundred users to few million users in a matter of seconds and few minutes. So it's, so scale on its own is interesting, but we, we also have the ability to do that dynamically. So that's a quick snash, a snapshot of Sumo as a company. So why don't we get started on the main topic of today's session? But before we do that, Charles? Yeah, I think, uh, Mitch, can you push that uh, uh, poll through? Because I can't seem to get the button to work. So we, we're kind of curious on what your role is uh, as we start talking. Are you a developer, uh, an SRE, a security analyst, an architect, or, or some other? We're getting that poll out just a second here. <laughs> okay. Get Big Martin to cooperate with us. Yep, sometimes technology fails. We all know that. I'm kind of interested about the profile of the audience here, Charles. 
because uh, what we are seeing is sometimes companies where there are people who can do multiple roles or perhaps all of these or some of them are super specialized. Yeah, we did a, uh, a survey and uh, I, I remember doing one survey, it was about developers, but we asked them what their primary uh, position was. So, so here's the, uh, the polls up there now. <clears throat> So again, what's your uh, primary position? You're a developer, an SRE, security analyst, an architect, or or some other? Sometimes when I when such a question is posed, Charles, I feel, hey, am I a tier one analyst? Or if you think of a security operations center, right? And then I'm a software architect or in the modern cloud world, am I a cloud architect? All answers are relevant, folks. Yep. Depends yeah, on what hat you're wearing today, right? Right. Yes, all, all of the above. That should have been an option too, right? Some days. Yeah, it looks like we're getting some good responses here. Um, I'm going to do a quick countdown in about four seconds and we'll close that so we can get some answers here. So three, two, one, gone. Okay, so, so let's take a look here. Um, looks like it's about 25% are security analysts. Uh, we have 13% there that are architects. Um, and then other dominated with 56%. So people are doing a lot of jobs. <laughs> yeah, there. but kind of curious if you can put in the chat what some of those others are because uh, yeah, that'd be great. That, that would be interesting for, for us to know. So uh, uh, I'll pop you know, that can question in the chat later. Too. Back to you guys. Cool, Thank cool. You. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so definitely, Charles. I think uh, we have a mixed representation that is to be expected in a in a hybrid persona targeted session like this. So that that's cool. Yep. Well, okay, folks. We'll get going. So, uh, we all know technology proliferation is an ongoing opportunity as well as a problem, right? So, so I, I remember. Um, in fact, not so long ago, I, I was at an event, at an enterprise event. I posed this question um, uh, saying, how many technology tools and or tools or technologies do you use? Um, the answer was clearly split. This, uh, the, this was a large enterprise. This was a, a in industry forum. And this particular attendee said, um, said, hey, I use some, roughly about 75 tools and technologies in security. And then I said, okay, because he was, uh, it was a security specific answer. Then I asked, hey, how about IT? Oh, that's more than 200. <laughs> so, so I, I, that, that, but that's a reality in many uh, uh, enterprises today, where it's fairly common to not only have 50 to 100 security tools and technologies, and plus several hundred of IT tools and technologies and they often tend to be disparate and they're fragmented. So, so when I look at this, I, 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 it, it's not only the, tech, the expanding tech stack, but also what I call the ex exploding number of components. This is all the way from, hey, modernized, mod, uh, modern ways of serverless or microservices or containers or v VMs, so on and so forth. So what are you seeing, Charles, from your perspective? Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Garish. And, and you know, uh, Accelerated Strategies did a survey last year about uh, Kubernetes. Uh, it was about data protection, of course, but we did ask how they're being used and what technologies they're using. 39% of the respondents in that uh, survey have multiple applications deployed using Kubernetes. So what, the, what that kind of means is that they have a ton of containers, applications, microservices and interfaces, just as you explained, all of these components are being kind of thrown at uh, the problem, I guess we could say, of of trying to get businesses uh, active in the cloud and, and other operations. And, you know, I'm sure that a lot of this uh, has accelerated over the past year as uh, people have had to uh, move away from doing uh, in uh, you know, in home or, or, or uh, you know, in office activities and doing them in the cloud in an expanded environment. So that's just making the, the technology complexity even even grow faster. 
Yeah, no, that that's great insight, Charles. So, so sometimes when I talk to our our go to market teams as well as prospects, I need to ask what version of or what kind of Kubernetes distribution is it? Uh, because there are so many different versions that 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 are out there. Even within that, there is fragmentation or proliferation. Even within different Kubernetes uh, uh, bundling, so to speak. Yeah. So uh, I, I briefly talked to this in the introductory part of my own profile. If you think about what, do, what does technology proliferation lead, uh, lead to and how are companies embracing, we have to rapidly embrace and adopt accordingly. And it's, it's not only the journey from legacy old ways of doing it, but also modern DevOps and CI CD ways, right? Which further leads to what we like to categorize that broadening the attack surfaces or attack vectors. So Charles, I know uh, yeah, Accelerated has spent quite a bit of time in this. Uh, what insight well, do you have for us? You know, this is this is the whole issue of security and, and the world uh, as we're moving forward. You know, all these technologies are great for the companies as they uh, expand their businesses, but sometimes I wonder, is it uh, is it worth it because of that explosion of attack services? You know, all of those new components become potential attack surfaces, and the speed of the changes that are going to be made or, or that are required as you move to the cloud, as you're bringing up new services, it's hard to measure that. And the, if you can't measure it, the attack surface it becomes even more complex. You know, in that same Kubernetes survey I previously mentioned, we asked a question of, of respondents, you know, what they felt was the most vulnerable area. And 43% of the respondents kind of clicked the all of the above question, <laughs> right, on the attack services. So they were saying that container vulnerabilities, access control, platform, platform vulnerabilities, and network management were all equally vulnerable. So you're talking about a broad attack surface. I mean, that that's one because you can't even narrow it down to say, all right, I need to concentrate on one area. And it's definitely a challenge for sure. Yeah, yeah. so what you, what, you, uh, what you implicitly said there, uh, I, I completely agree with you, Charles, is the known base of how things were done before are still relevant in the modern app development world right or app modernization world it, it there is it, it happens at a much faster pace maybe it's ephemeral instances but still you need to do the fundamentals of security and operations uh, 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 right yep cool and, and the other thing folks it's the data explosion right so we've been talking about this for ages the digital transformation, digital disruption. I like to call it, frankly, data deluge, right? Meaning there's so much information that's out there. And if you continue to use your legacy fragmented tools or silo tools, one for on-prem, one for hybrid, one for cloud, it's, it's, it's you're still going to have the same problems. The ROI or the business outcomes that you're hoping to achieve just won't be there yet. OK, um, do a, a quick time check. So coming back, uh, continuing on the journey of uh, the today's topic, I'm going to spend a few minutes on app modernizations. We want to understand not necessarily where you are on your journey per se. This is more of a, 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 a things that you want to consider. At Sumo, every year, we, we put a report out called Continuous Intelligence. So the whole idea of the report is we, we report back on how what the data we see within our platform, of course, is completely anonymized and things like that. What we saw last year, the report came out, I think, end of October. I don't don't pin me down for the exact date. Um, but what was in, interesting and expected from our perspective, 80 plus percent of the customers used at least one cloud. The multi-cloud adoption was still happening. Um, and uh, hybrid also existed. So in other words, even though we are a cloud native platform, we have customers who are not in the cloud yet, right? So we have other mechanisms to support both on-prem hybrid as well as cloud native capabilities. What was interesting bringing it back to today's topic is there is a continued adoption or growth in adoption of 
uh, use of container technologies or serverless technologies, which as you all know, serve as a foundation for what many people are calling is the modernizing today's apps. So, so the indication was that roughly about 40% of the enterprises are adopting microservices platform to build their apps. That was an interesting data point for us. And I encourage you to take a look at the report. I provided the source here. I don't have a, 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 a hyperlink for that. We'll, if, if you're interested, just ping me, mgbutt at sumologic.com. I can get it to you. So I, I think this is the most understatement <laughs> of today's session. When I say cloud adoption is growing, I mean, this is just happening, right? We all know that. I like to look at this in three broad categories, that is, Cloud start, cloud first, cloud native. So when I, what do I mean by cloud start? These are typically legacy companies or companies who are saying, hey, I'm going to tiptoe into this thing called cloud. I want to try it out for one-off project. Maybe it's a pilot project and then see how that goes before I get comfortable with the cloud thing. Uh, cloud first are those companies that are also tend to be either legacy um, uh, on-prem or uh, enterprise software companies or customers who are, who are adopting cloud. However, in this case, they've experimented, things have gone well, and they've, they have a top-down mandate. It could be from the board of directors, it could be the CEO, CIO, or all of the above, right? Which is a common response today in our, uh, in our uh, session. So this is where they've said, everything that we're going to do is going to be in the cloud. We may still have our footprint of legacy ways of doing it, but everything new is going to be in the cloud. That's what we're calling cloud first. Sometimes people call it cloud smart as well, right? Thanks to our other analyst friends in the industry. So but cloud native is the one that's gained a lot of attention and momentum. Think of the financial tech companies, health tech companies, software companies, right? So these are the companies who don't know what an on-prem solution is or the, most of what they do, I won't say all, uh, most of what they do tend to be using modern software and modern app development technologies. And this is where that's part of their DNA. Sumo started in, in, with this 11 years ago and we continue to be that. There is no uh, uh, sniff or whiff of anything related to on-prem, uh, even though we support our on-prem customers, everything we do is cloud native for scale, agility, and uh, ROI perspective. I think we have a poll next. Charles, I think you're on mute, sir. Mute, there we go. Yes, uh, we do have a poll. And uh, so the question is, where are you? Where is your organization fall on this cloud adoption? Are you at cloud start, cloud first, cloud native, or not on the cloud? It really would be interesting <laughs> for that one. But let's uh, uh, let us know where you think you're organization is on their adoption. Well, very interesting. It's a very, uh, it's, it's a horse race here. Interesting. All pretty close, all pretty close right now. <clears throat> Yes, yeah, so, so depending on the forum, I, I see mixed results. If I go to a cloud native CNCF like event, it could be a majority cloud native or cloud first, uh, uh, um, but nevertheless. Yeah, yeah, we'll give it uh, just another, another just moment to finalize. I think uh, Mitch had uh, done a countdown, so I'll do a countdown. Uh, so, uh, uh, five four three two one and we are closed so again the uh, it looks uh, pretty interesting so almost uh, half of 42 percent of our uh, attendees are in the cloud native uh, space and the next highest is cloud first and interestingly 15 percent were both uh, starting and not in the cloud so uh, I would hope that the people not in the cloud are really here to get that information and to uh, uh, start their journey. So uh, with yeah. that, we can move on to to the next part of uh, Perfect. and continue.
Right. Yeah. yeah. So that, that, that data is interesting because what it said was roughly about 40, 45 percent of the attendees are in the so-called cloud start and cloud first. And that happens to be the biggest opportunity for app modernization. Even though cloud native uh, tech, uh, solutions were all built using kind of modern, they may not have used the best practices here. So, but you're you're right. Uh, you're in the right uh, right session here. Meaning, these are the uh, if you're taking your that first cloud project or you're mandated, it's been mandated that everything is going to be cloud. That's the biggest opportunity. It's not only uh, maybe uh, I, we hope that you do things more than refactoring your apps. That is shouldn't just be lift and shift. It should be re-architecting using modern principles. So, so that's that's if I think of the app economy, the multi-trillion dollar market, folks. It's a cloud start and the cloud first as the biggest opportunity for solution providers as well as customers, right? Because you have so many, you have hundreds of tools to help you on your journey there. So I think Charles, uh, you have some great insights on how this is all working out and what to consider, right, Charles? Yeah, I'm going to do some table setting here for you and uh, uh, give some information as we start moving towards uh, uh, software improvement, uh, uh, app uh, uh, modernization, and uh, you know just some general information to help us as we move through this uh, environment of uh, software modernization and of security. So. The first part really is, you know, what is, why are we talking about the modernization? And part of that is going to be software delivery management. So why is that important? You know, as we start moving forward and we want to make software better, we have to have quick, have quickly available and updated software for cloud environments. And to do that, we were talking about the app modernization. And yeah, you can build apps uh, without uh, doing uh, fancy things, without uh, having a software delivery management process, but it becomes extremely difficult to understand what everyone is doing. You know, the quick comment on, on software delivery management is that it is a way to align software development and delivery teams while software is developed. So it's designed, so SDM is designed to foster the communications of all parties across application life cycles. You're gonna hear us talking about uh, uh, communication across uh, organizations a lot in the next uh, uh, 20 minutes. So SDM is designed to foster this communications and you know, I admit it's still developing but Accelerated Strategies Group produced a state of the software delivery management report last year. And the information that is presented in this slide is from that report. And you can see that 50% of organizations are not able right now to figure out the cost of application development in its different stages. They can't determine the cost to fix defects after the software is fielded. And if for some reason you don't release the software, it's a security flick, fix or or uh, the quality control kicks it back or it doesn't have the user interfaces you want, you can't really figure out what the impact of the lost time is gonna be to the business. And we gotta remember that there's a business justification for building an application. So if you can't answer these questions, you have a problem. So getting the handle on the totality of your software development is why software delivery management is important. <clears throat> now, the other aspect of, of where we're going forward with your uh, software modernization is what is uh, the priorities of your IT organization. So we've talked about software delivery management, but what are your priorities as you're moving to the cloud? And you know, I'm a market analyst, so I like to speak with data or at least with, with charts. So when looking at what an IT budget priorities are for companies, there's three big items that are standing out right now. Digital transformation, cloud migration, 
and of course, cybersecurity. And without doubt, these issues are driving most companies. Now, the other items are clearly important. I mean, you want to have cost savings, and if you're in a financial organization, healthcare, or any other critical infrastructure, compliance is big. But in reality, those can be accomplished by making improvements to the big three, by making the transformations, uh, uh, by doing the cloud, and by improving your security. So it's kind of uh, interesting to, to think about how those components are in this chart, and they're very close together. Uh, there, there's very little difference in them. So I'd like to say they're the big three. And in reality, they kind of cut across different aspects of the organization, right? The, the uh, business group is really pushing probably for cloud. They need to get out to the cloud to reach their customers. Security is really interested in making sure that things stay safe. And your transformation is going to be pushed a lot of times by developments or, or uh, uh, the technology people who want to uh, make things easier. So the next part, though, is what about your security challenges? So we get our last poll for today, and that is going to be uh, when you think about your organization's uh, greatest security concerns. Are you and kind of leading back to the other guys? I did not put it all of the above on this one, so you kind of really need to select one. And it's uh, application security. Uh, is it? Did that kind of go out? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, application security and uh, malware, misconfigurations, security operations, that is really the ability to respond, and you know security awareness, kind of the people question on that. So uh, go ahead and, and answer that question, and we'll uh, uh, just take a, a very short moment to get a feel for what your greatest cloud security concern is. What do you think, uh, Garish? Uh, any any suggestions or what you've seen? What you think the uh, leading concern will be? Uh, you're you're on mute there. <laughs> yeah, you got me this time. <laughs> Uh, playback time, thank you, um, nevertheless. So what I've seen, what I expect or today, it's just how is that relevant to my job? That's what I tend to see, depending on the persona of the attendee. They either have a more broader perspective or a more uh, uh, day in the life of my job kind of feedback. So what we are seeing though is they're all intertwined. If you are not security aware, your organization is, more likely application security misconfigurations will creep in, right? So, and that will be malware. You may inadvertently click on malware, leading to more infections, leading to secure. It's a continuum. I look yep. at this one, yep. the, the, the wheels of life. That's how I look at this. All right, so I'm gonna close the poll right now. And uh, interestingly, when uh, it looks like many people probably would have liked to have selected uh, all the above because, uh, uh, we had uh, four, three of the sele selections, security awareness, security operations, and uh, application security all got 25%. And then malware and misconfigurations got the next 25%. Uh, and interestingly, misconfigurations came in at the bottom. However, <laughs> when asked when asked about uh, uh, Cloud native security concerns. We we have uh, misconfigurations was number one in that <laughs> uh, uh, situation. So I find that uh, interesting, and it could be as a result that a lot of the uh, respondents today were in the security space. So misconfigurations are, are generally not in that uh, uh, space because security concerns have changed from my early days, right? So before malware and insiders always topped the list. And now we're looking at, especially when we're talking about, you know, the cloud, we're talking about cloud misconfigurations, insecure APIs, 
are the most important in this cloud native concerns uh, from uh, surveys that, that others have done. And, you know, the importance of general vulnerabilities is still there, but other parts are, are important. You know, I find the, the uh, uh, secret leaks, you know, I always think, oh, okay, I can, I can understand that. But it isn't really what I think about, right? It's not about losing secrets, i.e. via uh, valuable data, uh, you know, personal information or whatever. It's about secret keys and passwords that are embedded into software components. So many of the largest security issues are the result of misconfigurations, as I mentioned. And that is by far one of the hugest problems when we think about breaches and the stories it's misconfigurations. Uh, so it's kind of interesting in our survey that, uh, that that wasn't the top concern, but it is in, in many other organizations. So I'm going to uh, take a short detour from security, but I'll be back. I'll be at back to it. But I just wanted to take, spend a few moments on the movement towards consolidation or at least the cooperations between development and operations. You know, to build and maintain software requires both functions, operations and development. Uh, but when they're segmented, it can be difficult. So DevOps aims to shorten the system's life cycle, uh, the system's development process by providing continuous delivery of, of high quality software. You're bringing them the communications between the developers and the operators is to be improved. And that way they can uh, kind of help each other reach their goals much quicker. And that's really what's important when we're thinking about uh, the development of cloud native software. So that's just the, the, the quick uh, issue of why we have DevOps together. So returning to security, which is a concern of people, what about if we take DevOps and we add security to it, right? So we're really concerned. We have security concerns around cloud and the accelerated software development. So if DevOps can improve the speed, quality, and agility of, of your software development, why don't we throw security into that mix to make the software more secure too while doing it at speed? All right, so the aim of DevSecOps is to tear down silos and to introduce shared responsibility of the security tasks throughout all phases of the delivery process. So before security has always been kind of the role that is outside of, of any other processes and in most cases, in the years that I've been involved in it, it was always considered the the showstopper, the no, the point, the point where you want to, where you're going to get no. So we want to try to bring the, the security tasks into the process. So the key, the two keys for DevSecOps is automated enforcement of security policy throughout the software development lifecycle. But you also have that cultural change. And I find it interesting in the poll that we did have a lot of people who said one of the uh, issues is security awareness. And I think this plays into uh, the DevSecOps space of, of having uh, the security instituted as a cultural change where the understanding and belief is that security is important. It's as important as functionality, customer experience, and quality. So in this model, security is part of the process and should not become a bottleneck vastly inhibiting the delivery cycle. So Grish, I think we're all set, right? We can go home now? <laughs> Quite to the contrary, Charles. So, it, it, it's, it's, so for me, when I look at the philosophy as you've identified here, right? It's, I think DevSecOps does a good job embedding security as part of the developer ecosystem and perhaps even pushing the code out, right? But unfortunately, it's that's where I've seen it, where it stalls because 
in many companies, DevOps and SecOps, security operations are fragmented, isolated functions because of legacy ways of doing it, even though you may argue that DevOps is a more modern approach because the scope of what DevOps or DevSecOps currently is, is taken upon itself is quite different from what someone would do in a security operation center or SecOps. This to me, the survey it results that you highlighted, Charles, the fact that misconfigurations and API secu insecurities uh, were ranked higher, which means there is a trailing effect. People don't quite realize the impact of a misconfiguration up until it shows up as someone exploiting that in the form of malware and then getting breached or that's that sort of reactive activity. By then it's too late because that functions are fragmented today. And that's, that's, that's where I feel uh, the industry needs to do better and the silo separate ways of doing things. Uh, this is noble, right? I mean, I think in spirit it works with bringing application security as part of the developer ecosystem or paradigm. That's great. It, that is working. However, I think overall from minimizing the number of attacks or ransomware attacks, or, which we hear about every day, continues to grow. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and DevSecOps is the op is the optimum, right? So just like software delivery management and DevOps, we are all in the infancy of moving uh, towards complete integration. You know, for too long, organizations have worked independently within their own si silos. So when you see numbers like this that are presented in this in this slide, almost all developers see a disconnect between their workflows and security, which hurts their productivity. And security tests, on the other hand, uh, could be better, and they also hurt productivity. So the good news, the, the silver lining in this, I think, though, is that we see the problem, and it does come down to communications, right? Having all these groups be able to communicate with each other. So while I was doing some research on this, I ran across uh, uh, Conway's Law, and Conway's law comes into play. So it was really interesting. And I think uh, uh, something that people should uh, should look at. Uh, so Melvin Conway was a computer programmer from the 1960s. Now he didn't really make his observations associated directly with software development. It was more about just about how groups or, or uh, panels, uh, teams got together. But he made the observation that organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs <laughs> which are copies of the communication structure of an organization. Now, in other words, the lack of communication, specifically a communications infrastructure, can prevent holistic security development. Now, I find the words that they used in, in this and, and some of the explanations are very hard to, to understand and, and to get through. So I'm kind of thinking of some way to, to make it make Conway's law a little more understandable. And I think that the story, the elephant and the blind men might be applicable here. So the blind men can only relate to what they can feel. So they have no idea what the completed product is. And in this case, the completed product is an elephant is supposed to look like. So the communications between the entities seems to be a huge theme, right? So being able to communicate the different parts and the different aspects and how they all fit together is really what uh, Conway's Law is all about. So as we mentioned regarding uh, software delivery, DevOps and DevSecOps, the, the Conway's Law is, is really uh, how to explain why this is so difficult to make it work together. Now, we're doing a lot of work. We're trying to uh, fulfill the promise of Dev DevSecOps. And, you know, personally, I have confidence that we will implement it. Uh, this will be overcome. So, Garish, do you have some insight on how people can go about making uh, DevSecOps and our app mitigation and cloud native approaches work? I, I do, Charles. So, um, yeah, so that's that's a good segue to what we think is a step in the right direction. So I'll preface 
in the next few slides by saying we've had customers who started off with what I would call the cloud, fir cloud uh, first approach, not the cloud start, cloud first, that the one in the middle where they decided to focus on things in the cloud and where they had separate IT operations or observability or DevOps teams and separate SecOps team. And fast forward a year or two years later now, companies like Genesis, USA Today, among others, they don't have the separate barriers or silos. They're working together, sitting side by side. If, and uh, th that's, that's very encouraging, meaning uh, the teams are co-located, doing things together. And even if it's oral communication versus feeling of blind people feeling each other, it's, it's at least they're in the proximity so that fewer communication barriers and consistency in what they're doing. But there's a lot that needs to get done. Uh, what, what, is, what I find encouraging is many of our customers are going down that route because the, uh, the old school ways of doing DevOps and also security operations are slowly devolving and rather it's converging towards doing things together. No, no barriers uh, to operate as well as onboarding new apps and services. So having said that, so our view is that, you, you, taking it back to the original slide where it talked about technology complexi complexity stacks, the technology stacks are going to be in place. However, our view is that you need to have a one unified approach that's that's based on a, found, a platform that's foundationally secure. So what we encourage our, our community to do is to start with the secure cloud native platform, because I, I don't see frankly much of a need to go back to old school ways of doing a software development and security. Uh, the tools are here today. We do provide many of them. There are others in the industry who make it augment us and others may do something similar. So we always encourage start with the unified approach with things. Um, that starts with the one single cloud platform, right? So uh, I, I often hear from the community, vendor community, including some of uh, my vendors in the space where they have a separate security cloud, say separate IT operations cloud, separate observability cloud. And then of course there is going to be vertical clouds that's further segmenting the problem and making it worse folks. Pick a platform that can solve a broad range of use cases. Quick, and, and again, uh, pick the licensing or modeling that connects with you. You may have, as a developer, you may have something that's consistent that's required from an operations perspective, but settle on something that's fairly consistent, right? So we offer something called credit space licensing. That is, we give you the option to use it for your operations use case or DevOps use cases. You decide. We don't dictate saying that do it this particular uh, do it uh, um, uh, um, uh, a way in which that that's not uh, conducive to achieving your technology and business outcomes. And end of the day, it's about analytics and intelligence. You, you may have the tools and technologies. How are you going to provide the right insights? And then is a platform secure? I have a slide on this because this is arguably one of the more important points I want to make. In a platform, make sure it, it's compliant. Compliance doesn't mean HIPAA and PCA, GDPR, uh, capable and things like that. Yes, we do do all those things to enable the businesses but also from a security perspective, right? So I'll get into that in a second, but before, at the broader perspective, think about what do you use, want to use the platform? Today's topic is about application modernization and uh, particularly from a security lens. And that's what we kind of talked about, right? Pick a platform that helps you not only monitor and secure your microservices platforms, pick the microservice platform that you, can, you want. Is it supported? Is it distributed or, or, or not distributed? Are you optimizing the consumption? Can you monitor your multi-cloud? If you are using AWS, Google, uh, Azure, or whatever other variant, can you do that? How about Kubernetes? Don't just start with the Kubernetes only platform. The, the problem space as Charles highlighted is much broader than that. Can you do app security, right? So, so and can you then map it into the security operations thing? So think about these things while you uh, take your cloud start or cloud first journey. And uh, uh, as I promised, make sure it's rooted in best, best, best in class security. 
which is important in the cloud world because as uh, Charles highlighted, the number two challenge they said for IT initiatives was cyber, or uh, excuse me, the I, number two focus for IT initiatives was security. Make sure your foundation, aka your platform, has those attestations, has those audits in place, is certified because that's an indicative of best practice. We have we spend millions of dollars in uh, at a, a platform security and attestation. That is not to ensure that you have the right access controls in place. Your platform is secure. All uh, transactions are held uh, are private, and so on and so forth. So finally, our view is that we encourage you to always use modern security and security operations principles for modern app development and modernization. Because if you don't do that, you'll continue to be exposed. Your vulnerabilities will continue to be there. It may be determining your app vulnerabilities or security posture or misconfigurations. A single platform is the way forward. And we encourage you to uh, join us in that journey. So Charles, at this point, yeah. I'm going to have the session back to you, sir. Yeah, Garisha, I, I really think it's important to, you know, the really issue is speed up incident investigations and response, right? That's one of the keys that we're seeing and a modern platform and modern directions are the way to do it. So we can look at our vulnerabilities and, and give our, our posture and, and see incidents. Uh, a lot of tools have been doing that. And uh, I was one of the first uh, analysts uh, a long time ago to start talking about uh, uh, sims and things but really the issue in today's world is that speed and i think that's where uh, devops and, and devsecops is really trying to make sure that we can stay at the speed of of organizations moving now you know the whole thing of of uh, app modernization and is speed and we saw that in in the devops and, and so that's kind of the, the important uh, aspect here is uh, speed. And to do that, you need that modernization. So, uh, uh, you know, I think some of the other things will, will come. So if you can do the security with speed with uh, and, and do it in a uh, uh, secure and uh, manner is really what's important as we move forward. Yeah, no, you're right. So one comment I'll make here is, so the way in which we look at is, you, you need to um, adhere by certain compliance mandates or HIPAA, PCI, whatever, to enable your business plus the SOC 2 type 2 kind of, that, that's like foundational. Know your vulnerabilities, whether they're app vulnerabilities, device vulnerabilities, or misconfigurations, right? So that you know what your security posture is all about. And then to your point, Charles, it's about, it's all about but knowing that information, can you respond, investigate, making sure it's not a false positive, right? So, and then improving and automate the response. So th that's the direction where uh, the industry is going and uh, it, it, it's, it's interesting times. And I'm, I'm, I'm definitely encouraged by the direction in which um, many of our customers and community members are uh, taking this, uh, securing the app modernization, um, uh their strategies so we'll see what happens hopefully next year when we do a follow-up to this charles it'll be interesting to see where we are yep yep so mitch i think it's uh time for you if there's any questions and if we have time to do any questions so uh yeah we do <clears throat> i've got a couple a couple of things you know there were a few questions i'm going to summarize and maybe take a little bit of a, a tweak at because i think it'd be a good discussion to hear what your guys' thoughts. Um, you know, we've all been doing security for a while, and traditionally security is about protecting things, right? How do you defend against attacks, et cetera? And of course, Sumo Logic and giving you information about what's happening and <clears throat> tools like that. There's, there's emerging a view that our response and our ability to respond is equally important. We should be investing as much in our ability to respond and the reason why I would argue that, just for the sake of argument, is we've kind of hit this tipping point of it's not it's not if you're going to be attacked, it's when you're t attacked or compromised, and it, and everything is happening so frequently, whether frequently whether it's supply chain attacks, it, we're we're past this point of you know 
they're they're busy attacking other people because I'm well defended. No, we're all going to get attacked. I think observability <clears throat> into the security fabric and infrastructure is an essential ingredient to be able to have an effective response capability. And I don't just mean process. I mean, you got to know what's going on, going on. You got to see where it is. You got to know what the impact is. You have to figure out what you do to, to respond to it. You guys, you guys agree with that theory at all? Oh, you want to go first, Grish? Sure, sure. Yeah. So, so I, I, absolutely. I, even if I uh, think of this outside the sumo lens, right? So if I think about it, there is a lot of commonality. Security many years ago was part of overall IT infrastructure and solutions. So the reason why I feel sometimes even today in my job, I, 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 I talk about our solution as a secure observability platform. Uh, meaning I don't see them as discontinuous function. I look at observability, whether you're looking at an app performance, what is, I, I look at performance people measure just as saying how fast or how slow it is performing. I look at all that is, does it comply with the right uh, mandates? Are the right people using it? Uh, and it, was it, does it have any vulnerability? So I look at that as part, integral part of how it is. So that's that's a fabulous question. Because our, if I'm jumping back, putting my sumo hat on, we look at them as in one conti contiguous uh, um, platform. So that's why sometimes my colleagues either use it as, as observability and security are in one continuum, or I like to call it secure observability platform because it's all all in one from my perspective. Charles? You're on mute. We got you on mute this time, Charles. I'm hitting the wrong button. <laughs> there we go. So, yeah, I agree. And it's all about uh, visibility and being able to, to stop attacks uh, uh, quickly. And I think that goes back to that speed, right? So if we talk about, Mitch, that you probably are going to be attacked. And as we can see, the people are concerned about vulnerabilities and loss and misconfigurations and uh, lost secrets, that all of those things can contribute to that. What I think the discussion today and, and as we keep moving forward, and, and I've said this before, is, is and where I think DevSecOps is moving is it's a team sport, right? We can't just silo the, the ability and say, security, you have to uh, fix this or, 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 you know, you have to discover a problem and you have to find a way to to mitigate it and and move on from it. In reality, it's a team sport. And uh, if we can cut it out early, then that's great. If if it comes in late uh, after something's been released, or you know, because vulnerabilities show up who aren't even known, you know, you don't even know it can be exploited until until someone does, uh, and then you'll have to fix it that way. But I think as we have a continuum. And everyone needs to be part of this. And I, I, you know, we mentioned communications a number of times. It's all about being able to communicate across security, dev, and ops, and, and to make it uh, so it's not limited to one guy. The dev's not limited to making sure they write something good. Uh, ops isn't really 100% geared towards uh, making sure configurations and security isn't just there to, to clean up the mess. They kind of all need to be doing those things together. We'll get there. We'll get there. Well, who knew that cloud would start as, out as a big security concern? We don't want to use it to cloud and cloud native and DevOps has brought us all together. How, there you how go. amazing is that? That's, that's awesome how things happen. Well, I'd love to further that conversation another time. You guys are fantastic. Really enjoyed uh, your dialogue and your engagement. And I think that was uh, really appreciated by our audience today. Uh, I do want to take care of a little bit of housekeeping. Just a reminder, everybody will get an email with a link to the recording and uh, handouts uh, information from the slides. Do want to let you know about our four gift card winners. Those winners are Doug F., Joseph C., Carlos M., and James M. So congratulations. The folks here at DevOps.com will be in contact with you about how to get a hold of those gift cards. Maybe you can go take a vacation now and spend a little bit of that money there. So <laughs> Charles, uh, Karish, 
wonderful job. You both are fantastic. I look forward to interacting with you again in this and in other forums. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And please thank our, our presenters as well. Have a good day. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Mitch.